is Joe Kess, the Executive Vice President of the Grassroots Institute, which is an economic research organization and a nonprofit taxpayer watchdog that promotes values of individual liberty, economic freedom, and accountable government. Joe grew up on the Big Island and attended the University of Hawaii at Hilo and Minnesota State University, where he obtained his degree in education. Joe was a public school teacher for eight years here at King Kamehameha the Third School in Lahaina and a Sleepy Eye Public School in Minnesota. Now that's kind of interesting, Sleepy Eye. I'm going to have to have you tell us a little bit about that, Joe. He is also a former student fellow at the Foundation for Economic Education. Good morning, Joe, and welcome to the show. Good morning, Pam. Thanks so much for having me on the show. And, uh, you know, you just reminded me about Chief Sleepy Eye, which the school was named after in Minnesota. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's an interesting name for a school. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm so glad to have you on this morning. I had the pleasure of attending one of the forums that you've been bringing to Maui, and you brought Tobias Peter, uh, an assistant director of the American Enterprise Institute Housing Center, and he is a phenomenal speaker. And the topic yes. was really geared around Hawaii looking at a Tokyo model that he presented for housing. Joe, tell us a little bit That's about great. how you brought Peter here and some of the big takeaways that that um, you felt that he shared during the, the models that he presented to us on zoning. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, he talked about the Tokyo model for housing, and, and we've heard a lot about different housing models recently, the Singapore model, the Vienna model, um, and and those models tend to focus more on public housing and the state as your landlord. Uh -huh. And we wanted to look around the world to see what other models there were. And it turns out in Tokyo, an amazing thing has happened. Housing prices have stayed flat. Right. And despite, you know, housing prices skyrocketing in all major cities around the world, you know, especially in Hawaii and Maui, uh, home prices stayed flat in Tokyo, and and there's one person who knows why, and it was Tobias Peters. So <laughs> he presented on that. Yeah, it, you know, it was uh, again as you talk about, and and we've done projections from a for our housing forum and said, at a very very low interest rate, very low four percent, and we got. Mm -hmm. You don't project forward usually, except for when you're looking at reverse mortgages. And I, that number I was given was told it's extremely low. And I said, well, we want a number nobody will question. Continuing to project out, we've already exceeded the 2024 projection, which would be over a million dollar median home price. Yeah. And we projected that we would hit over $2 million median home price at that 4% in, uh, annual increase in uh, 2042. So this wow. hits everybody. Wow. And so yeah. to hear that Tokyo has a model where it's staying flat. <laughs> well, just imagine, in Tokyo, you can buy a two-bedroom apartment for $1,000 a month. Yeah. <laughs> and that just almost seems unbelievable right now. And it's been that way for the past two decades. Um, and so why, you know, what has happened where um, they have actually provided enough housing for everyone? And, um, and the answer is they've allowed people to build. Um, their system is really based on a market and property rights system with little possibilities for local interference. And right. so in Hawaii, we often see public input at every step in the housing process, and that often delays or kills housing projects because often the neighbors don't want the projects next to them, and, and they're the loudest voices at those hearings. But in Tokyo, almost all the housing is done by right. And that means if they have the right to build in their zone, then they don't need to go through the public hearings. They can just build. And that's partly because they've kind of zoned to allow for more housing. Right. And let's talk about how they've been doing that with inclusionary zoning. That's right. That's right. So, um, well, in, in the U.S., inclusionary zoning means, like, affordable housing requirements. But in Tokyo, inclusionary zoning means you're including um, the lower zones are included in the higher zones. So for example, 
in the lowest density zone, the single family, you know, um, zone in, in Tokyo, um, it, it allows for three story buildings and so on, but um, not many businesses can build there. But in the higher zones, you know, in the more urbanized areas in Tokyo, you can still build uh, a single family home. I mean, it, in the in the most urban district in Tokyo, you could have, um, you know, a, a, a very high story building that right next to a single family home. <laughs> and that almost seems uh, unbelievable. But of course, on Maui and in Hawaii, um, we don't allow the building of housing in the business districts. In fact, on Maui, I think there was recently there was. a bill rejected at the council that yeah. would have allowed vacant spaces in industrial areas, uh, but uh, that got voted down. Yeah, yeah, we opposed that bill, and the reason we opposed it, and it was, it also uh, had apartments that you could have apartments in these areas. And the, one of the things that I thought they did right in the bill was say, look, we, because it's in a commercial area, we do want to have an environmental assessment to make sure, um, you know, for example, if you if you were going to be within a certain radius of, say, a, a prior gas station or something, we want to make sure that um, it's in an area where we're not worried about, for example, some sort of toxic leak. Or, uh, but then there was also inclusion of looking at ways to landscape and to provide buffer areas in the development, oh, which, I see. which would have been helpful as well. But mm -hmm. the, the, we got really hung up on things like, well, there might be late night noises, which by the way, you know, in ag properties, we have that as well, right? You can, you can farm sure. later at night and you can have loud mm -hmm. noises. Um, we got a hung up on things like lighting and certain things. But the point is that, first of all, in developing a development in those areas, you're, the developer is not going to develop something that they won't be able to uh, either sell or lease out, right? They're not going to put a huge investment in doing that. And people will have a choice. And it was for apartments. And, and so, again, people would have a choice. And right now we have so many people saying, our choice is to have a roof over our head. Our choice is to have right. an affordable place to live. So it was really, right. in my mind, shocking that we didn't recognize that. And also, it was also apartments. So people could rent there, and it would be a great demonstration model, in my mind, to look at other alternatives mm -hmm. because people weren't making the life choice of, say, owning there. It gave us a lot of flexibility. And I think that what we saw, and you had a great picture of an area where somebody had a large estate home surrounded by, mm -hmm. you know, buildings in Tokyo and that they could keep their large estate home in that area while we allowed other, while Tokyo, not us, but while Tokyo allowed other uses. And it was... Yes, that's right. And, yeah. and in Tokyo, if, 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 if you have a mansion, for example, in Tokyo, you could tear it down and build affordable housing if you want. If you had a group of houses, for example, that wanted to demolish and instead build apartments, they could do that too. Um, but in in Hawaii, in Maui, that's a lot more difficult. You would have to ask permission from the, the government and, and that might be a political process. But notice that in doing that, if, if you uh, replace a mansion, for example, with um, a low rise apartment complex, you could actually increase the value of the property since you could get more money per unit. And so, and that's a weird thing. I mean, you think, oh, it's always the most profitable to build a mansion, but that's not true. Sometimes it's actually more profitable to build apartments, um, you know, or even affordable apartments than it is to build a mansion. Because, you know, if you think about a mansion can only get a few million dollars, but an apartment complex could be worth tens of millions of dollars because of all the tenants living there. But on Maui, we make it so difficult to build apartments uh, even low-rise apartments that the developers often just say, well, uh, they throw up their hands and say, okay, I'll just build a mansion instead. And that means that, you know, you have one person living there or one family rather than a lot. And that's um, basically broken our, our housing system. Absolutely. And this Tokyo model really showed that. Um, I, I mean, it was just very clear. I, I wish we had had more legislators in the audience because it that whole point about how to use the land and how to best utilize it and the way that we can model after Tokyo to have more density in an area yeah. and that we in Maui have 
we we have such limited density. I mean, we we've got big parcels of land with very few homes on them, and and yet the conversion in Tokyo to go from that, if you so choose, as you point out, to increasing your property value by um, upscaling them and and having more density and use on the land, and the tremendous amount of housing it creates. There were some other. Well, and also, oh, go ahead. Um, I was going to say that um, in so doing, then you refresh the housing. I mean, a lot yeah. of housing on Maui is uh, many, many decades old, um, and it's crumbling. And you see, you know, on social media, these um, posts of a million dollar, a picture of a million dollar home on Maui. And, you know, it looks like it was built in the 60s. Um, and, and that's because it's so difficult to build here that um, nobody tries, and, and there's really no incentive to tear down old buildings and build a new one there. Um, or, or a new group of buildings there either. Yeah, and by the zoning change, this eases that, and then you see brighter, fresher, uh, more up-to-date with code communities as, mm -hmm. as we're mm -hmm. rebuilding because they don't have to go through these long processes to try and get things through, which is really phenomenal. Um, one of the things... Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that it also, you know... Uh, some people might wonder about infrastructure, by yeah. the way, <laughs> because if you're building so much more, then how do you uh, um, create the infrastructure needed for all these new homes? But uh, Tobias explained that infrastructure is really, um, is actually benefited by a policy that's more favorable toward development because um, more housing equals more tax revenue, which yeah. can pay for the infrastructure, like yeah. roads, you know, bridges, electricity, and, and so on. Yeah, that was a great point. And the other point that I found fascinating, but also Tokyo has a different system, was parking. And that um, in, in many, they, they can either address parking in the development or not address parking in the development. But Tokyo, because of the narrow roads, doesn't have a, uh, they, you know, there isn't room for on-street parking. So one, that doesn't happen in those areas. And two, and I found this when traveling there, that you you cannot even buy a car until you can prove you have a space to park it. So a lot of people were the developers and I was asking, well, talk to us about parking. But what they, they found though is of course, there are more walkable, bikeable communities as well in Tokyo, which is really exciting. And then some developments have parking and some developments don't. But again, that's a consumer choice on where you wanna buy in. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's um, something on the mainland that they're doing, you know, Minnesota um, and Oregon and California, they're starting to relax these um, stringent parking requirements because not everyone needs or wants a parking space, um, and and that add you know um, that requirement adds to the price of the house, which you know that's what we're trying to address. Is the houses are so expensive, but also. Um, in Tokyo, they allow for higher buildings. Yeah. Um, you can, you know, have a three-story building. You know, in, in Maui, it's you can have maybe a little less than a three-story building. So, um, but with three stories, you can put the parking underneath the housing on the first floor, for example, and and that solves the parking problem. Yeah, and and um, and Tobias was saying, look, it's, it, given where we're at, we're just talking about going up. A, a few feet because <laughs> we're just under yeah. sort of that that three-story limit that allows Tokyo right. to do it but if we just went up a few extra feet mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. would make a huge difference and, uh, exactly. and again allow for more density in, in different areas and it's really uh, the whole presentation I, and I know that there was so much to share and he did an awesome job just trying to get through as much of it, it as he could in the time that we had. So now, and I know he has phenomenal slides, and I know that you've been doing this across the state. What is the Grassroots Institute's next steps? How do we work with the state and counties to move in this direction? Because it is a model that from those I was sitting with, which included many community organizations that work in housing, as well as developers, uh, we all just went, wow, minor changes, 
but I mean, some of them bigger in terms of um, understanding the, den the density things, it's sort of a bigger change, but things like if we just go up a few extra feet, we're still protecting views, we could address parking and other things a different way. Where do, where's yeah, grassroots going exactly. next on this? Well, of course, we brought Tobias out here um, not to look at, um, you know, how do we make Maui the next Tokyo. Right. <laughs> no, no, that's not our goal. Because, yeah. you know, <laughs> that's right. We, we just wanted to see what has worked and what what ideas can we pull from, like the, the you know, the slightly higher um, uh, building heights and parking and, and little things like that. What, what can we bring to the state? And... We've talked to a lot of uh, legislators and council members and who are very much with us when it comes to, yes, in my backyard. And we, we hear a lot of people say, not in my backyard, you know, no new development, don't try new things. And, uh, and but we want people, and we want to try to find those people who are into the yes in my backyard movements, which have taken a foot on the mainland, you know, in California, and Minnesota. Um, and uh, uh, many Democrat and progressive circles, by the way, have um, have risen to the yes in my backyard movement, and and that is actually starting to take a foot here in Hawaii with a lot of um, prominent lawmakers. And you know, just last year there was a yes in my backyard, or excuse me, this year a yes in my backyard uh, bill passed to at least look at the issue and look at them, um, you know, to try to figure out what could we do to restructure the zoning or housing uh, system to make it work. So we're, you know, little by little chipping away and it takes education and that's what we're all about is just trying to get ideas out there and let's talk and let's work together. Um, that's what our CEO president says all the time, Kelly Akina, a Hanukako, let's work together and that's our motto. Yeah. And you folks are doing a great job. Uh, you know, you're a phenomenal think tank organization bringing in experts like this. And it really was a great presentation. And how can people who maybe weren't able to attend but are interested, where can they find it? Well, thank you. Yes. And, and we just put it up on our website. And we have the whole video and we have a transcript. If you go to grassroots institute.org and remember that singular grassrootinstitute.org then you can find the video and read the transcript and uh, actually the the presentation was really funny in a lot of places too so, <laughs> so hopefully your <laughs> listeners will catch that it it was and again you know, I, I appreciate the work you're doing i know you've also been giving testimony on housing issues this is such a critical need for our state. It's a even more critical need in Maui County. And it's something that we all need to partner with and work together. And, and I love seeing this phenomenal presentation um, on this. And you've been doing others. So. Oh, yes. Yeah, we, we've, uh, we did another presentation on the Big Island that was uh, well received. And, and we'll continue to do uh, more of these types of presentations. We have another presentation um, scheduled in August, on August 18th, at the Maui Arts and Cultural Center, and that has to do with um, fixing the state budget and the county budget, <laughs> yeah. and uh, so if you'd like to learn about that, you can also go to our website at grassrootinstitute.org. Yes, well, you are, we're excited with the programming that's coming through. Thank you so much, Joe, for... Uh, doing this presentation, bringing Tobias, you know, looking at models nationwide and examining different areas that both Maui and the state of Hawaii can look at our housing differently. It is a statewide issue and it is something that we desperately need to solve. And, and again, you started with one of the things that I thought was really important because again, as we, we're watching our median in, um, home prices rise. We're seeing a lot of others coming in, finding that we're, quote, very inexpensive and, and buying things up. And we're pricing people out of the market. And so this, the flat models that this presents are some really great models. But again, it's about getting more built. So we truly appreciate that. Yeah. 
and um, and you're doing an awesome job. So thank you for all that you do um, all the time. And, and this is just one of your many topics, as you point out. <laughs> we talk a lot about, you know, uh, responsibility, fiscal responsibility in government. That's and, right. And, um, you know, I, I, this is also a very important election year. It's really important that we get the right leaders who are willing to explore new concepts and move us forward. And thank you for all that you do in that arena. And I'd love to have you on the show again soon. Great. Thank you so much. And we just, you know, cheerlead the work that you folks are doing at the Maui Chamber. Uh, it was just so awesome to have your voice there. And, and uh, thanks for having me on the show. We'd love to come back. Thank you, Joe. It's my pleasure. And I hope you have a great day. Thanks, you too. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.